Hello and welcome to the UIM webinar series. This is Jim Rush, editor of UIM, and it's my pleasure to introduce today's presentation titled Evaluating and Deploying a Pressure Sewer System, which is being brought to you by Environment One Corporation. Today, more municipalities and engineering firms are relying on pressure sewers as an alternative to septic tanks. Today's presentation will discuss the economic and environmental aspects of pressure sewers as well as ways to ensure homeowner satisfaction before, during, and after project completion. Our speakers today are Dan Gantz and Clark Henry. Dan Gantz is currently the manager of Gannett Fleming's Pittsburgh Regional Office Municipal Services Group in the Environmental Engineering Division. His area of responsibilities include the management of municipal services staff in the planning, design, permitting, bidding, and construction management of municipal water, sewerage, and stormwater projects. Also speaking today is Clark Henry, who is Director of Engineering in the Sewer Systems Business for Environment One Corporation. A graduate of Clarkson University in Potsdam, New York with a BS in Mechanical Engineering, he has 23 years of engineering experience in the pressure sewer industry in various design, application, and leadership uh, project and leadership roles. Clark is also active in various industry associations, including the Submersible Wastewater Pump Association, National Sanitation Foundation's Joint Committee on Wastewater Technology, and the National Fire Protection Association's Technical Committee on Wastewater Treatment Plants. Uh, following the presentation, we'll have a question and answer session, which will be moderated by George Borsham of Environment One. And uh, to participate in that, you can use the control panel on the right-hand portion of your screen. Uh, in that, there is a question and answer panel within that uh, uh, control panel. And you can activate that by using the orange arrow key on the right-hand portion of your screen. So we'll go ahead and get started. I uh, would like to remind you that you can ask your question at any time during the presentation. And they will be answered following the presentation. So now we'd like to go ahead and turn it over to Clark Henry. Thank you, Jim, and good afternoon. It's my pleasure to participate in the webinar today. I'm going to provide a very brief overview of pressure sewers and set the stage for Dan later in the program. I have seven slides and two poll questions for us today. Let's begin with some definitions. A pressure sewer incorporates a network of grinder pumps to transport wastewater through small diameter pipes to a treatment system. This graphic represents a simple lakefront pressure sewer. Wastewater flows from the homes being sewered near the water through the service collection lateral to the pressure sewer collection system or pressure main and on to the wastewater treatment plant. As you can see with this example, pressure mains are typically laid along the edge of the roadway following the contour of the land. Grinder pumps located at individual home sites reduced wastewater solids to a slurry through the use of a grinding mechanism. Pressure sewers were first used in the early 1970s, and today they provide reliable service daily to millions of users worldwide. And with that, put those smartphones down. That brings us to our first poll question. Have you utilized pressure sewers? Um, we're asking this question just to get a better feel for uh, the participants today and just find out how much exposure our audience has had to this technology. The use of pressure sewers has grown substantially over the past 20 years. Um, and now, as evidence of that, many of our participants today have logged on from throughout the world including Australia and Sweden. So we're going to wait just a few more seconds for that poll. Okay. And now with that done, we're going to move along to the next slide. Pressure sewers are an economical solution to geotechnically challenging environmental conditions where other techniques may not be practical. These conditions include 
rocky soil that is difficult to excavate, hilly undulating terrain that requires moving wastewater uphill to the discharge point or treatment site, high groundwater that makes excavation difficult, and long flat terrain that would require numerous lift stations with a gravity sewer system. Pressure sewers enable cost-effective development of land previously considered marginal or unusable. They require minimal environmental disruption during installation for both new and existing communities. This low-impact installation often protects existing infrastructure and environmentally sensitive green space areas such as forests and wetlands. The closed piping network of a pressure sewer eliminates infiltration and inflow, minimizing the size of the treatment plant and eliminating plant overflows. Pressure sewers are compatible and often used with other collection systems. They may discharge into an existing gravity system or community on-site treatment. And finally, from a community development standpoint, they may be used to facilitate or actually limit community growth. Typically, a grinder pump station is located in the yard or basement of each home. Wastewater from the home enters the grinder pump station via a 4-inch gravity line. The grinder pump grinds any solids in the wastewater into a slurry and pumps it through small diameter pipelines beginning as small as an inch and a quarter in diameter that are buried just below the frost line and follow the contour of the land. Wastewater may be transported over flat land for more than two miles or vertically up to 185 feet or anything in between. A typical grinder pump station consists of a base grinder pump, level sensing system, discharge piping and valves, and a control panel. When the wastewater in the basin reaches a predetermined level, the level sensing system activates the pump and the basin is evacuated. Pumps typically operate approximately 15 to 20 cycles per day, with each cycle lasting less than one minute. The wastewater volume between pump on and pump off is typically 10 to 15 gallons. This is to assure that the wastewater from the home is quickly moved through the pressure sewer system. The pipe diameters used with pressure sewers are much smaller than those used with gravity sewers. This light touch on the land minimizes excavation, labor and material costs, and the time required to complete construction. And it's much less disruptive to trees, lawns, sidewalks, and other underground utilities. Installation trenches are often eliminated completely with the use of directional boring. This significantly reduces site and restoration costs. And this brings us to our second poll question. What is your biggest sewer challenge? A, groundwater, B, rock, C, water table, D, flatland, or E, funding? I think most people associate pressure sewers with lakefront development, obviously where waste can be pumped uphill from the lakefront to either an existing gravity line or a pressure main. But also, it's very popular in rocky applications. And probably the ultimate rocky application is Alcatraz Island. The Federal Clean Water Act in the early 1970s had shut down um, Alcatraz Island for discharging directly into the bay. Uh, the pressure sewer technology allowed Alcatraz Island to reopen to the public in the mid-1980s. I can see we're going to take a few more seconds for this polling question. We also know that funding for municipal projects, um, often 75 to 80 percent of municipal projects will be funded through a municipal bond.
Okay, and with that, as I promised, that was a very brief overview of pressure sewers. At this point, I'm going to turn things over to Dan, and he will speak about a case study of one community's implementation of their sewage facilities project using pressure sewers. OK. Thank you, Clark. Thank you for the overview on pressure sewers. And welcome and thank you to everyone for their participation today in UIM's webinar. Thank you for your patience. Today we're going to talk about Cool Spring Jackson Lake Latonka Joint Authority and their sewage facilities project completed in January of 2002. There is a written case study uh, to accompany the presentation. It was prepared in association with Cool Spring Jackson Lake Latonka Joint Authority, Trumbled Equipment, and M. Davidson and Associates. That paper will be located on Environment One's website along with some other case studies. Uh, on their on their web page. The goals of today's presentation is to review the process undertaken by one Western Pennsylvania community in implementing a sewage facilities project that utilized low pressure sewers and individual grinder pumps. To review the collection sewer collection alternatives that were available to the community and to review the different types of grinder pump technologies available for pressure sewer systems. And of course, the lessons that we all learned with this specific project and some changes that we've made um, at Gana Fleming moving forward to other communities, uh, sewage facilities projects utilizing pressure sewers. And then finally, to present an evaluation of the community's cost to operate and maintain the individual grinder pumps. The municipalities that make up the private community of Lake Latonka uh, being uh, Jackson Township and Cool Spring Township in Mercer County, Pennsylvania, formed a municipal authority in 1999 for the purpose of evaluating sewage collection, conveyance, and treatment alternatives that were available for the private community of Lake Latonka. Lake Latonka is a lake community, a, approximately 300-acre lake, uh, man-made lake, that uh, basically the municipality's municipal boundary splits right down the center of the lake. So it's pretty much equal customers in each municipality. For those not familiar with Pennsylvania government, the utility authority is usually formed when multiple municipalities are going to implement a jointly owned infrastructure project. And the purpose of that is really to carry the indebtedness between the two municipalities through one single en entity with the municipal guarantees of the tax revenue being in place. It actually is as much more work that it causes for engineers, uh, legal, and bond counsel. It actually simplifies the borrowing process for the municipalities. And the debt that's incurred by the authority for the infrastructure doesn't count towards the municipality's individual debt limit. Uh, for more information on municipal authorities in Pennsylvania, uh, you could go to the state web, Pennsylvania State website, uh, PMAA, the Pennsylvania Municipal Authorities Association has a website that describes authorities uh, in general. In 1999, the authority then evaluated three alternatives for sewage collection. Uh, the gravity sewer alternative, which would consist of approximately 93,000 feet of gravity sewer and seven pump stations, had an estimated project cost of $7.25 million. The vacuum sewer alternative would consist of approximately 84,000 feet a vacuum sewer pipe with two main vacuum stations and then individual vacuum valve pits and the collection uh, and treatment cost of $6.4 million. That was the estimated cost. And then finally, the pressure sewer system had about 80,000 feet of sewer line with individual grinder pump units at an estimated cost of $5.8 million. Now, each of these project costs had one thing in common, and that was a 150,000 gallon per day activated sludge wastewater treatment plant to treat the sewage. After the cost evaluation of the alternatives that were available, the pressure sewer system alternative was finally selected. 
some of the factors that played into uh, the selection process for this particular uh, community. Depth of bedrock. If you are in the process of designing or contemplating designing a, a sewer system of any kind, a drive through the area where the sewers are going to be extended can, can usually tell the tale about the depth of rock. A lot of the homes at the Lake Watonka community at unusually high first floor elevations relative to top of ground with ground sloping towards the house and through conversations with property owners, most of them ran into rock during the construction of their, of their basement for their home. Also, the high water table along the lake, uh, the, the soggy conditions where the gravity sewer would have to be installed. Uh, the gravity interceptor under the gravity sewer alternative would have to be very close to the lakefront in order to collect the sewage from the customers that live along the lake. The concern with the community uh, residents was that the bedding around the gravity pipe would drain the lake or cause a draining effect on the lake, uh, which is the uh, key attraction to living at Lake Latonka. And really no local experience with vacuum sewer. Very few contractors in western Pennsylvania have any kind of real experience with vacuum sewer. And there was a concern by the communities and the authorities part as to uh, what kind of competitive pricing they would get, what type of system would be installed, what problems they may encounter with the system when it came to the vacuum sewer. And then finally, lowest cost alternative. Funding was being sought through USDA Rural Utility Services, and the present worth analysis for each alternative was, was considered. Uh, in general, and, and those listening can consult with their local uh, funding agencies, generally the lowest present cost and alternative is going to be the one that would be funded by the federal funding agencies. So that played a, a big key. So after the pressure sewer system was selected and the project was going to move forward, an evaluation of the technologies was, was being undertaken by the authority. And the, and the fortunate, we were fortunate in having an authority and a community that was very active and very vocal in the whole process. Community involvement, your client involvement, customer involvement, uh, is, is very important. The, the more information you get out to people, the better off you are in the long run. The more cooperation you get, the more detailed questions uh, that need research are asked, and, and that's important for an overall successful project. It was very successful here with Lake Latonka. Basically, there are two types of grinder pumps, the centrifugal and semi-positive displacement pump. And just briefly, the centrifugal pumps uh, their output vary, varies widely depending on head conditions. They're usually one or two horsepower motors with high RPM. Uh, difficult, it creates a difficult design, uh, in my opinion, with centrifugal pumps because the number of pumps that can operate simultaneously in different design conditions. Another factor that was considered is, is with the different size impellers that may be required over such a large system as Lake Latonka. We would have to have multiple spare impellers on hand or multiple pumps equipped with those impellers for, for service calls. However, the centrifugal pumps can operate at a high pressure, no discharge condition. And with oil filled motors, they can operate in dry conditions for an extended period of time. Uh, some of the centrifugal pump manufacturers uh, available, uh, ABS, Sifara, Barnes, and Myers, just to name a few. With the semi-positive displacement pump, the flows are more predictable and tolerant of widely range, a wide range of uh, varying system pressures. They're typically one horsepower, low RPM motors. And they do offer a relatively simple design due to the one size fits all uh, pump, if you will. Their constant capacity, variable head application to be used for high head or even negative head uh, conditions. Clark mentioned earlier uh, the, the new E1 extreme pump pumping against a total dynamic head of 185 feet. Uh, the Cool Spring Jackson Lake Latonka Joint Authority pressure sewer system actually has a negative head condition, a static, negative static head of approximately 100 feet. 
and there are many pumps on this particular project that do pump downhill. The semi-positive displacement pump will continue to operate under increasing system pressures and the capacity of the motors and the, and the ability of the components to withstand the pressure is met. So therefore, they use thermal overload switches or high temperature sensors. Uh, and with air filled motors, the pumps cannot operate in dry conditions. And some example of semi-positive displacement pumps, of course, Environment One, Barnes and Vortex, uh, to name a few. So there are pros and cons to, to either technology with the uh, for, for grinder pumps and typical versus semi-positive displacement. The next step in our process in evaluating the type of grinder pump that would be used. Several interviews and site visits of similar size systems uh, local to western Pennsylvania were conducted. The closest size at the time was about a 100 unit system. Again, a lake community approximately 30 miles north of Lake Latonka. Uh, geographically speaking, uh, those not familiar with western Pennsylvania, Lake Latonka is situated approximately halfway between Pittsburgh and uh, City of Erie in western Pennsylvania along the Interstate 79 corridor. In addition to the local interviews, the authority board members actually went to several pressure sewer seminars and talked with operators, managers, uh, business managers for systems in pressure sewer systems through in Tennessee, West Virginia, and Maryland. Uh, there, there are a few pressure sewer seminars uh, 10 years ago in, in, in the Pennsylvania area, and people came from multiple states and offered their own insight, comments, and uh, lessons learned for the pressure sewer systems. And then finally, one of the most important things was the grinder pump demonstrations and open houses that were held for the customers. On at least three different occasions, the authority offered a grinder pump demonstration at a, a at the lake community-owned property uh, to basically demonstrate the grinder pump, how it works, how it operates, uh, different items, although inorganic, how they could be ground uh, and, and not uh, comp complicate the operation of the of the grinder pump. A very successful. Uh, series of seminars or, or open houses that were held. And probably the most important thing that we did was the do's and don'ts of grinder pumps. There are certain things that should never be put in the sewer system, whether it's gravity, vacuum, pressure sewer. Uh, and we're all familiar with those inorganic items, and we'll talk about that in, in more detail here shortly. So with all that being said, the sewage facilities were constructed. Again, we had 150,000 gallon per day activated sludge sewage treatment plant, 6,900 feet of six inch pressure sewer, 24,100 feet of four inch pressure sewer, 12,500 feet of three inch pressure sewer, 15,700 feet of two and a half inch pressure sewer, 22,900 feet of two inch sewer, and 21,900 feet of one and a half inch pressure sewer. Now the majority of the one and a half inch pressure sewer included the service lines from the pressure sewer main to get within 150 feet of the structure being served. And again, this is a, a, a Pennsylvania uh, specific item. The Pennsylvania Second Class Township Code, which the two townships that made up the sewage authority have, have to follow their Second Class Township Code. Uh, Second Class Township Code states that in order, in order to mandate someone who is currently on an existing on-lot sewage disposal system, the, the governing agency has to extend that sewer to within 150 feet of the primary structure of the building. Now, with the lakeside community and a lot of houses sitting down by the lake with the pressure sewer up by the road, there are several extensions that were necessary to get within 150 feet of, of some of the homes. And all the facilities that were installed by the sewage authority are now owned and operated by the sewage authority. So the, the extension to get within 150 feet is also the, in the ownership of the sewage authority and their maintenance responsibility. And then also we, we 
I purchased 500 Environment One 2000 series grinder pumps. That's the series or model of grinder pump prior to the current uh, extreme grinder pump. And the sewer line was all installed with open cut installation methods using SDR21 PVC pipe. Now since the completion of this particular sewage facilities project and the development of directional drilling within western Pennsylvania, uh, HDPE pipe is, is used much more commonly. In fact, Gana Fleming, that's what they require on their projects, uh, directional drilling using the HDPE pipe. In our final project cost for the pressure sewer system, $5,693,000. Project funding uh, back in the day, if you will, uh, almost 10 years ago, USDA Rural Utility Services grant of $2,089,300, which was about a 35% grant, a 40-year loan through USDA Rural Utility Services in the amount of $2,553,700, and local share, a local share was required and it was paid through individual tap-in fees, and that's the money that the authority had to come up with on their own in the amount of $950,000, which was actually through a, a as, as I stated, a tap-in fee. It was $1,900 per customer. And with the $1,900 tap-in fee, the grinder pump was also provided then to the customers for their private contractor's installation. In this particular project, the authority purchased the grinder pumps, had them available for the property owners for their own individual contractor's uh, installation. Uh, and then the grinder pumps would be owned and operated by the municipal authority. And again, we'll have more on that a little bit later in the lessons learned. Lessons learned. Some of the things that we did learn uh, on this particular project, and uh, Gianna Fleming and myself specifically has done, had done pressure sewer projects in the past, but honestly never to the magnitude of 500 uh, individual grinder pumps. Um, one of the things that we do now moving forward and we would recommend to anyone considering this type of sewage collection system is use the pump manufacturer's service lateral kits. Almost all the pump manufacturers will make a service lateral kit which consists of a, a plug valve, a check valve, the compression fittings, and the valve box for the contractor's installation where the separation is between the authority's maintenance and then the service lab, private service lateral connection to the grinder pump. The uh, purchasing the different valves and, and check valves and assembling it in the field, uh, the metallic material, uh, using, the, using the plastic material of, of today is, is far more beneficial, far more efficient uh, with assembly and we've literally had no problems with the service lateral kits once the initial installation and connections were made to the uh, service lateral that was you know, service connection that was left for the for the property owners. I would never go back to the uh, metallic fittings. Again, we'd specify or require directional drilling wherever practical. Um, directional drilling was talked about a lot in, in uh, 1999, 2000. I think there may have been one directional drilling contractor in this part of western Pennsylvania. And it was kind of just really ramping up to where it is today with regards to, to sewer systems, although uh, gas companies use that uh, quite often and had in the past. We would procure the grinder pumps through a separate contract, which we did do on this project. That's the, the first time. Uh, I was involved in a separate procurement for the grinder pumps. Typically, uh, it's a buy and install for a, a contractor for the, for the for the grinder pumps. Um, you get the, the economy of scale for buying a large number of pumps uh, this way. You have control of the type of pump that's going in the ground, the distribution of the pump, the tracking of the serial number for each of the property owners, which will come in handy later. Uh, there's just a lot of benefits that come from procuring the grinder pumps through a separate contract. And then finally, uh, owner-contracted installation of the grinder pumps instead of 
property owners unit using their own private installation contractor. This particular project at Lake Potonka, the property owners were required to contract their own uh, installer to install the grinder pump. I uh, can't emphasize enough that if you can have the owner install the grinder pumps, even if it means an additional charge, project cost, tap-in fee, and your overall project cost, you have much more control of the quality and the type of contractor that's installing the grinder pumps. What, what we do on our projects now is uh, actually a separate contract that's bid for the installation of the grinder pumps. Uh, in this particular project, we had a couple contractors we had to ask politely to leave just because of the havoc that was being uh, invoked on the sewage facilities that were already installed, which goes back to the service lateral kits. Uh, several of the metallic fittings were taken apart, put back together, check valves in backwards with the connection uh, where the contractor got a little carried away with making the connection. So I will emphasize that again, that if you can add the cost to your project and have the grinder pumps installed for the customer and then simply have the customer make the gravity sewer connection from the house to the grinder pump, you'll be well ahead of the game. So eight years after construction completion, there are now 590 grinder pumps uh, in operation. We did add one duplex uh, centrifugal pump station for an auto auction. Uh, it's uh, a low flow six days of the week, and Friday it's a very large flow. And that two-inch force main from that pump station discharges directly into the six-inch pressure sewer line that was installed as part of this particular project. The authority does keep detailed records of service calls on all the repairs uh, by serial number, by property address. And the owner has, since the beginning of the project, had a user fee per month that included a $2 per month grinder pump reserve fee. So the grinder pump reserve fee was actually established in order to provide a comfort level to the customers that sufficient funds would be available in the event that repair costs would escalate with age and or at the end of the useful life of the majority of the pumps. So it was actually a customer or resident driven request for the authority to put money aside uh, for that rainy day when they did need the money to replace or, or repair a pump that needed some type of major repair. So the concept was actually a combination of the customer request, but actually uh, borrowed from rural utility services. Uh, they generally have a requirement for a capital improvements fund uh, where a, a percentage of the uh, debt service over the 40-year life of the loan is, is put aside in the capital improvements fund so that in year 20, sufficient funds are available to the borrower to uh, replace or repair uh, equipment that would normally only have a 20-year life expectancy. So we kind of borrowed a little bit of their uh, philosophy uh, in establishing that grinder pump reserve fund. Historic service calls. Uh, again, the system operation and maintenance is by M. Davidson and Associates of Jamestown, Pennsylvania. They're about 20 to 30 miles away from uh, Lake Watonka, their, their uh, corporate offices. In the first eight years, there were 210 service calls, 148 which resulted in some type of repair. Uh, the total service call and repair cost approximately $107,000 over the eight-year period. This cost, however, also includes warranty costs that were not paid by the system owner. In other words, the warranty on the pumps uh, that was purchased as part of the procurement contract, if a pump was repaired and uh, it was covered under warranty, the cost associated with that repair was still documented because what we wanted to do here is try to present uh, what the actual costs were uh, holistically in the total dollar amount, not necessarily just out of pocket for the for the owner. And those total service uh, calls and repair costs uh, includes 
So we're in year nine now. I'm going to bite my tongue when I say this, but we're in year nine, and we've actually had only 10 or less than 10 uh, rebuilds and or pumps that were scrapped for parts and replaced with new pumps because of uh, different types of uh, needs for, the, for that particular pump. So the, the total repair costs actually does include uh, some new pumps that were purchased over that first eight-year period. Some of the types of service calls uh, on this particular system, um, and, and again, a lot of this could go into the lessons learned column as well. Uh, leaking panels, uh, by leaking panels, improper conduit penetrations that really don't meet the NEC. Uh, penetrations for the control panel for grinder pumps. Uh, the panel sit on the side of the house. So all the penetrations need to be in the bottom of the panel. Penetrations out of the house from the home's uh, breaker box through the wall of the house and into the back of the panel generally just causes moisture, uh, whether condensation or rain or uh, in this part of the part of the country, snow. Uh, once that moisture gets into the panel, it just it wreaks havoc inside that panel. And we have several. Uh, service calls for panels that some people wouldn't operate and it was moisture related. Um, the stator uh, replacements, uh, and the stator damage is mostly due to uh, inorganic material being discharged by customers with that out of sight, out of mind, uh, if you will. Again, this goes back to items that you never want discharged into any type of sewer, uh, but you'll find them quick with a, with a pressure sewer and a grinder pump. Um, Diabetic hypodermic needles, um, kitty litter, paint, oil, and my favorite fish tank gravel. Uh, fish tank gravel can easily be dumped in the garbage, but you'd be amazed how much fish tank gravel gets flushed down the toilet. Uh, you'll find it when you when you have the service call and you look in the bottom of the tank and there's fish tank gravel in there. You'll know what what caused the problem. And then at the very beginning of the project, uh, when people were first connecting. Uh, infiltration inflow related service calls. Um, the, the phone call would, would be uh, my alarm, my panel goes into alarm every time it rains. So every time it rains, you're getting a lot more water in the grinder pump than what you typically would during a, a dry period. And sure enough, there's some type of infiltration or inflow, whether it's a French drain or even a, a direct downspout drain uh, connected to the grinder pump. Those Infiltration inflow situations work themselves out pretty quick with these with these service calls. Um, our average daily flow at the wastewater treatment plant, uh, again, it's 150,000 gallon per day plant, uh, is, is roughly 125 gallons per day per customer uh, during the middle of summer, which is the, the peak of the uh, of the lake uh, community's uh, use. So it's, it's extremely low compared to a gravity sewer uh, application as far as flow per customer. Other items, nick buried uh, nicking the buried cable. There's a buried cable that would go from the panel to the grinder pump uh, through most people's landscaping and the shovel and the landscaping to plant a flower or plant a, a shrub. Uh, nicking the side of the, of the cable, letting moisture get into that cable is also uh, cause moisture uh, to get into the equipment and cause a, a call out and the need for a repair. And then finally, just some burn motors due to voltage spikes or, or just weak motors, if you will. When you buy 500 motors, you, you're sure that, that through statistics you're going to have a couple that are just uh, weak, weaker than others. Grinder pump maintenance cost. Our average cost per maintenance, uh, our average grinder pump maintenance cost Per pump per year over the first eight years is between $25 and $26 per year. Uh, I've heard uh, sales pitches from ver various grinder pump manufacturers ranging anywhere from $30 to $50 uh, per year. I'm not sure if anyone has actually sat down and calculated uh, what that cost is, but that was one of the things we wanted to do here with today's presentation and our case study was to determine what our actual cost was. And again, this cost includes the, the warranty cost. Our, our, average re our average repair cost for those pumps that required some type of repair uh, was $510. Again, there's, there's uh, less than 10 that were rebuilt totally 
be placed in kind with the new pump. Um, and it also includes the labor for the service call. Uh, unfortunately, most of the service calls don't occur between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. They occur on the weekends and they occur in the evenings when people return home from, from work. So there's the call out labor costs associated with the contract operator uh, crew coming out to the uh, property owner's site and, and investigating, the, uh, investigating the problem. So what is the future of the Cold Spring Jackson Lake Latonka Joint Authority and their pressure sewer system? Well, we've added about 10 grinder pumps per year, uh, less over the last couple of years, more in the initial years. Uh, so we're averaging about 10 per year. Uh, the grinder pumps are provided through the owner as part of the tap-in fee. And briefly, uh, when the property owner pays their $1,900 tap-in fee for their new house, they also pay an additional fee which is a basically a reimbursement cost for the authority purchasing the grinder pump and providing it to the property owner. And the purpose for that is the, uh, the authority wanted to maintain the same uh, technology, the same manufacturer uh, pump, and have control over where that pump was, was being uh, delivered and it, how it was being installed, and also they, so they could track the serial number in their uh, record-keeping system. Uh, why the grinder pumps were initially provided uh, to the initial 500 customers for the $1,900, and now that there's now there's an additional charge. The whole thought process uh, with this particular authority is you're telling 500 people that they need to replace their on-lot septic system. Uh, most most of them through malfunctioning on-lot systems, but. Uh, we've all heard my system is not malfunctioning. I shouldn't have to connect to the sewer. The thought was to replace, in order to replace that property owner's initial investment in their on-lot sewage disposal system, the grinder pump would be provided to them uh, as part of the initial project in their $1,900 tapping fee. But future developed properties, uh, new homes, in order to put everybody on an equal playing field, so to speak, that property owner would not only pay the tap and fee, but also pay for the cost of their grinder pump. In other words, trying to equate the new customers with the original customers. The authority now has over $100,000 established as a grinder pump reserve fund. Uh, a 10-year, $2 per customer uh, budget was $120,000. We're already over $100,000 moving into to, well into year nine. The authority maintains 10 spare cores for emergency installation. For those grinder pump service calls that cannot be determined in the field, what the problem is, a new grinder pump can be in, uh, installed while the diagnostics are being done back at the sewage treatment plant on the uh, grinder pump that was pulled. Also, uh, most states require a certain number of spare pumps or uh, cores uh, for this particular manufacturer. It requires a certain number of spares be on hand for 50 uh, installations, uh, you have to check with your individual state's requirements. Um, the 10 was required for the 500 for uh, Pennsylvania's Department of Environmental Protection. The authority does have a one portable emergency generator that they use for long-term power outages. That generator is, is uh, set up with a, a uh, control panel wired to the generator. So if somebody has a power failure, it's a quick disconnect of the grinder pump from the house to that control panel that sits on the emergency generator to draw, draw down the pump, uh, draw down the tank. Uh, it was actually only used uh, during two different storm events. In the first year of operation, there was a tornado that knocked out power for a few days to uh, a small part of the lake community. Uh, that generator was used, I think, once or twice during that uh, two or three day period. And uh, the remnants of Hurricane uh, Katrina, when it came through this, uh, this part of the, of the country, uh, actually caused a, a, a three or to four day um, power outage on, on half, of the, half of the lake uh, residents. And it was used about a dozen times at, at that particular uh, power outage. Uh, actually, one resident used it 
of those 12 times one resident, I think used at least three times, maybe four. Um, again, infiltration inflow, it's easy to find with this type of system. Um, it's always it's always people's concern. What do I do when the power goes out when there when there's a, a grinder pump that is used for uh, collecting and conveying uh, sewage? Uh, generally, if, if there's public water, there are some uh, facilities in your house you will be using. If you do not have a public water system and you're operating off of a well, uh, there's very little water usage unless you're going to transport it uh, in gallon jugs to use the toilet, for example. Um, of all the projects that uh, Gaina Fleming has been involved in in western Pennsylvania, uh, the long-term power outages have never been a problem with the uh, pressure sewer systems. Uh, people tend to people find a way to get by. There's a lot of storage capacity in the grinder pump tank, uh, so in, in general, we've never really had a problem. We we do have the nervous customer, as you can imagine, when your power is out and you have a uh, grinder pump as a means to convey sewage. And also, what we're doing is uh, continuing to track the service caller calls and repair costs uh, with a plan to when we reach year 10 to update this information and make it available to uh, uh, anyone that's interested in, in that type of information. Uh, as we get closer to year 10, uh, we may have more service calls. That's something that we're, we're going to track and track by year. And again, that information is available or will be available in Environment One's uh, website uh, along with other case studies. So with that, I'd like to turn over the uh, presentation to George Borsheim of Environment One uh, for the for question period. Well, thank you, Dan and Clark, for those most illuminating presentations. Wow, there's a number of excellent questions from our participants in today's webinar. So let's see how many we can get through in the time remaining. This session does need to wrap up on the hour. If we don't get to your question live today, check your email for further follow through. Uh, let's take a look, first of all, on the poll questions. It, it seems that about two thirds of the attendees today do have some experience with pressure sewers and a third not. So we have a fairly well educated audience we're working with today. The second poll question, if you remember, was. What, uh, what specific geotechnical challenge uh, were you facing, uh, be it groundwater, rock, uh, water table, flat land, uh, and then there was funding. It looks pretty even across the board as far as the challenges. Uh, however, funding seems to be the, the main concern, and that uh, pulled at uh, nearly 40% of the of folks participating today. Let's go on to the attendee questions. Uh, first up, uh, Ping asks, is there a handout available? I think Dan mentioned that uh, there will be an email that you'll get after this webinar with a couple of links in there where you'll be able to link directly into a PDF of uh, Dan's white paper on this project uh, along with other case studies. So uh, keep an eye out for that. Carlos asks, does the system have a filter? Uh, Dan, do you want to field that one? Um, as far as a filter at the treatment plant, it uses uh, just a conventional activated sludge. So it's uh, aeration basins uh, followed by clarifiers and then ultraviolet uh, disinfection. Uh, I'm assuming by filter, uh, trickling filter is what's being asked. It's, it's uh, related to odor. Uh, that was definitely one of the concerns of the uh, customers and the, and the residents of the community is what about odors? Uh, there's very little, if any, odor, and I don't recall any odor complaints at all in the system. Uh, I didn't think that there would be because it's a closed system. As far as the sewage treatment plant, I did have that concern myself. And how we accomplished um, odor control at the sewage treatment plant is a submerged discharge of the six-inch pressure sewer where it comes into the headworks, really a, a, just a bar screen. Uh, yeah.
year 2000, uh, we were designing a treatment plant around the um, average discharge per person or per, per customer. We call them EDUs, equivalent dwelling units in Pennsylvania. Uh, we were required to design around that state standard. We really had very little um, historic data on pressure sewer systems to go by to make a pitch for reducing the size of the plant. Um, knowing what we know now, the 150,000 gallon a day plant was supposed to last us for 600 customers. We are now at 590 and we're nowhere near the capacity. I think we have a pretty good case for future projects and uh, uh, for sizing the uh, wastewater treatment plant and reducing the, the flow per customer from the uh, uh, the state standard down to something more realistic or reasonable to what you would expect from a pressure sewer system. Um, just to add a little further, uh, Clark and I have also been discussing the sewage treatment plant at uh, Lake Latonka and doing some further evaluations and flow monitoring to try to get some additional data out there for people who are interested in sizing sewage treatment plants um, based on purely um, pressure sewer system. So the, the overall answer to the question is the plant size was the plant was really sized for a gravity sewer system, and that was a requirement uh, of our state at the time. Uh, and our lack of data being available for a system of this size and what impact. Uh, pressure sewer system of this size has on the reduction of flows. All right. Kelly asks Clark Henry, is there any design for Um, also have software available. Okay. Any particular nomenclature or, or type of software? Um, it, it, typically, it's referred to as system design software. I know mm -hmm. Environment One's is uh, design assistant. Okay. But maybe I could add something too to that, George. From a from an engineer standpoint, of uh, the questions asked, the the, the the way the question was asked, I'm assuming it was asked by a design engineer. Uh, what we've done in the past, uh, Gannon Fleming, is we've worked with our the local sales rep for uh, the pump manufacturers. In the case of Environment One, Western Pennsylvania would be uh, Trumbull Equipment Company out of Mars, PA, and have worked with them and uh, Environment One on the uh, system program. There is a system design program that's out there available for everyone's use, but we found it beneficial to go through the local sales rep and get all the latest information and upgrades to the program. Okay, thank you. Alan asks, if there is build-out in the utility district, how is that accommodated? And uh, either one of you guys can take that one. Um, well, if there's, it, the more customers that connect to the sewer, the, the, the velocity is going to increase in, in the pipe size. Uh, the program that we were talking, the design program we were talking about before, uses a uh, probable number of pumps operating simultaneously to determine uh, velocities and therefore pipe sizes. And it's actually a range. So if there's so many pumps operating simultaneously, statistically speaking, on a 50-unit subsystem, it's 50 to 70. It's a range. It's not just a, a, a flat, even number. So your velocities would increase. And the pipe sizes are uh, determined so that you at least have the 2 feet per second in all your pipes at any one time. And, okay. and you very rarely exceed any kind of maximum velocity in a pipe utilizing the, the program that uh, Environment One has developed. Ed asks, does your final cost show just the sewer system cost without treatment? And if so, does it include the grinder pump cost? The $5,693,000 project included all of the uh, pressure sewer installed, all the grinder pumps, and the sewage treatment plant. 
also, does the 150-foot rule mean the homeowner was responsible for the last 150 feet cost and or construction? Or was all the work done by this contractor and for the future homeowner? Uh, is, that, is that homeowner responsible for the first 150 feet from the pump? In, in, this, in this particular project that we've uh, uh, discussed today, the property owner or customer was responsible for uh, the 150 feet some, some were somewhere less, obviously, where the house was closer to the, the main sewer line. But the 150 feet plus the installation of the grinder pump that was provided by the authority. Uh, the lessons learned uh, moving forward on the projects that, that Gannon Fleming uh, does now for their clients, the, uh, we encourage the owners to also install that 150 feet, if you will, and install the grinder pump and build that cost into the overall project cost and the user fee structure uh, for, the, for the primary reason to have some type of control over the quality uh, of the installation. After all, the owner is going to install this when or uh, operate it when it's complete. OK. Uh, Clark Ross asks, can grinder pumps be installed in septic tanks? We, we typically don't don't like to install them in septic tanks. There are applications where they've been used um, even after septic tanks with the with the effluent. Typically with with our pump we would be going uh, either as an alternative to a septic tank or or in front of the septic tank um, just primarily due to the corrosiveness of um, the, the wastewater in, in a septic tank. So it has been done but it, it's not, uh, I, I would say it's not typically done. And normally, the pressure sewer would be used as an alternative. And Clark, here's another one. Can you have high level alarms in each sump or tank to call the utility automatically? There's quite a variety of different um, control panels available, um, all of which would include a high water level alarm to indicate that the water in the basin is above the normal pump on level and uh, approaching a point where you would want to give some type of indication um, that you have a high water situation. There are a variety of auto dialers and other communication methods that would dial a service person's cell phone or, or communicate that high water level situation. So yes, that, those are readily available. OK, Dan, uh, you may have covered this. Uh, Martin asks, are the grinder pump stations at Lake Latonka owned by the homeowners or the regional authority? If the regional authority, any issue with servicing the units on the homeowner lots? I think that's the real question. If it's owned by the authority, you know, what, what do you run into there? Very, very good question. The units are owned by the regional authority. Uh, and I, the, the question, I, I believe, is, how does the owner, the regional authority, uh, gain access to operate and maintain the pump when, when it's needed? Um, the uh, non-legal answer is you generally let someone on your property if your grinder pump doesn't work and you, you need to use your, your home sewage facilities. The legal answer uh, from, a, from an engineer is most of our uh, authorities or utilities in western Pennsylvania will enter into a grinder pump installation operation and maintenance agreement with the property owner uh, prior to construction. Uh, basically, what that agreement says is that the property owner is giving permission, in this case, to, if there were Cool Spring Jackson Lake Lutonka Joint Authority, to come on the property, install the grinder pump at a location uh, mutually convenient to both the property owner and the authority and then later to come on the property to own or to operate and maintain it uh, and diagnostic troubleshooting if necessary um, when, when needed. And that, that would eliminate the need for uh, permission every time access is needed to the property. And I would say you get about 99% of the people signing those agreements uh, before the project. And the last 1%, honestly, when construction starts and they realize the only way they're going to get the grinder pump installed for them on their property and then owned and maintained by the authority is to sign the agreement. That, that last 1% comes around pretty quick, too. 
Okay. Very good. Well, it looks like our time together today is up. Uh, thanks again to our brilliant presenters, Dan Gons and Clark Henry, for such a great hour. On behalf of E1 Sewer Systems and Environment One Corporation, thanks to UIM Benjamin Media for producing this program, and of course to all of our attendees. See you next time, and until then, happy sewering.